Hey YouTube, it's Dwayne here again today. I am excited to bring on the show Dr. Maurice Robinson. That's right, the Byzantine text form Dr. Maurice Robinson. So Dr. Robinson, why don't you go ahead and say hello to everybody? And hello to everybody. <laughs> Very literal, I like that. So I, I'm bringing you on the show because part of what I do is I, I like to get the textual perspective of as many people as I can, just because it's really interesting. You hold to a, a Byzantine priority position and you're so dedicated to that that you've actually edited did a Greek New Testament based on the Byzantine text form. Let me ask you, what is it? What prompted you to put the Byzantine text form together that we all know and love? Well, this is a long story, so I'll try to make it short. I originally was trained in normal reasoned eclectic textual criticism. My first textbooks that I read were Metzger's Text of the New Testament and J. Harold Greenlee's Introduction to New Testament Textual Criticism. As I entered seminary, this is the position that was being taught and I accepted it. And then I wanted to do further work in textual criticism. And the professor of the text critical class there, who also taught reasoned eclecticism, told me that I already in my own study had learned more than he knew. So he sent me over to Duke University to do study with Kenneth W. Clark, who at that time was the oldest living textual critic in the U.S. I started meeting off and on with Kenneth Clark for a period that lasted over seven years. And during that period, Clark is the one that influenced me toward the Byzantine text because he said, do you ever ask questions about reasoned eclecticism, its presuppositions, its theory and its methodology? And I said, no, I just thought this was what everybody held. And he said, well, I suggest you start asking questions. And he suggested that I should read the opposing side. So this meant basically Bergen, Scrivener, and various others from the 19th century. Slowly but surely, he finally brought me to the position that said, in his own words, he said, what he came to the conclusion of after a lifetime of study was that it was more likely that a single text type would re represent the original more than an eclectic pick and choose mix mishmash of theories uh, on variant readings. And he said, then if this is the case, it's either going to be from his view of text types, it's either going to be the Western Caesarean, Alexandrian, or Byzantine. And he said, we can rule out the uh, Caesarean and the Western, and that leaves the Alexandrian and Byzantine. And he said, then the case is which one seems to have the better pedigree. He encouraged me at that point to do further research on the Byzantine, since there were issues that he saw with the Alexandrian, he thought that I should see whether the Byzantine could contradict the issues that he saw on the Alexandrian dominance that tends to reflect in our current critical text. What was it that was like the most convincing point uh, about the Byzantine text that sort of put you off in that direction? Well, the one most important point would probably be the fact that if we've narrowed it down to the Alexandrian or the Byzantine, the Alexandrian text seems to be, from the evidence that we have, more of a local text of Egypt, and this would be following Streeter's theories of local text, whereas right. the Byzantine had a much more widespread position that it was found throughout most of the Roman Empire, at least in what we know from the fourth century onward, even was what Westcott and Hort had admitted that there was Byzantine dominance from the fourth century onward through the rest of the Middle Ages. And in doing this, the Alexandrian text decreased only to a small trickle with only a few manuscripts after the force right. really reflecting an Alexandrian text. The real key is a text that may have been dominant in Egypt, never seemed to become widespread, and then eventually died out, whereas a much more widespread text, such as the Byzantine, not only was widespread, but continued for well over a thousand years that we know of. And that widespread nature of the, the manuscript tradition for the Byzantine text sort of gives us a clue or a hint as to what was in that period of time where we have a dearth of manuscripts, right? It's at least a hint as to what was generally accepted. And that's within, at this point, the Greek Orthodox Church as the primary transmitter of the Greek manuscripts. Scholarship today is typically taking the position that there really weren't uh, text types, or at the very very least, they seem to be downplaying the role of text types in, in uh, text critical circles. What do you say to that? What, what's the response to well, denying all of, of text types? I agree 
that <clears throat> the concept of text type is erroneous if mm. we are talking about each text type as the product of a recension, which is okay. basically what Westcott and Hort were claiming for the Alexandrian, the Western, and the Byzantine at that time, which they called the Syrian text. And that's why they opted for the agreement of Aleph and B and called it a neutral text, which would be a text that for them preceded the existence of text type on the view that all of the text types were recensional. Now, I don't accept the recensional concept. Right. I think when you have people like Stephen Carlson, who is reflecting current theory saying we need to call these textual clusters where we have certain manuscripts that agree together and they will cluster together and what's in the Byzantine cluster is different from what's in the Alexandrian cluster, which is different from the Caesarean cluster and the Western cluster. Yes, then I think we have those. As long as you don't call them text types, I don't think we have a problem. But there are these clusters that are all representative of the one primary text, which was the autograph. And they have diverged in various ways, whether one of them is the actual closest representative to the autograph or not is probably the area of current debate. All right. So let, let, let's move on a little bit. So the, the Byzantine text form uh, that you, you put together, you, you had a little bit of help with that. C can you tell us about who it was that was helping you and uh, maybe give us a little bit of information on who he is, what he did? And William Pierpont contacted a Bible publisher that I was working for back in around 1976, wanted to know if the Bible publisher would maybe place his already compiled so-called majority text note in the back of the interlinear Bible project that we were working on at the time. The Bible publisher didn't know anything that much about textual criticism, so he passed it on to me and said, do you think this would be of any value? And I looked it over and I said, yes, it would, because it would be important to show where the Byzantine variations of text would be. By the way, this is as I have already moved to a Byzantine text position under the study of Clark. It was not meeting Pierpont that changed my position. In any case, it was by that letter from Pierpont that I started responding and corresponding with him, which was a process that lasted for years until he finally got a computer and we could do email sometime around 1991. You guys were networking before networks even existed. <laughs> yeah, we were doing it by uh, regular postal mail. That's and great. I had never met the fellow, even though we corresponded from 1976 on, I think the first time I met him was around 1986 or 1987. And that's oh, when I, wow. his home in Wichita, where he lived and he couldn't leave there because he had a severe medical issue about allergies that if he were anywhere away from the Wichita area, it's likely that his allergies would end up killing him. So he oh, stayed wow. uh, all his life. So what, what did he do with, like, did, did he help you in, in collating any, any manuscripts or, or running some numbers or what, what was his role in the, in the Byzantine Greek New Testament? What he had done at first, and he had started his work way back in 1965. And by the way, he was trained in the Westcott Hort theory and position way back in 1933. That's when he first was studying it in college. Oh, wow. And only starting in 1965, he changed his position and started studying and compiling what the Byzantine readings would be. And he first used the then available Nestle editions that had the Gothic K, which stood for the Koine or the Byzantine mm -hmm. text and noted the readings there. And then he expanded it to other editions and finally went into von Soden's very complex edition mm -hmm. and looking at von Soden's K readings and compiled entire list of what the Byzantine readings would be, compared it with the Textus Receptus, using that as a common base. And then he made his list of the changes that following the Byzantine or majority text would require and by the time that he wrote to the Bible publisher and I saw the letter and his list of changes, he had already done well over 90 to 95 percent of the work. Oh, wow. All wow. I had to do was go back and recheck his work. And that's taking a lot of time mm -hmm. to do because I had to look at all of his readings that he took from von Soden because he had no ability to check the manuscripts. He had only what was stated to be Byzantine readings in printed editions like the Nestle or the Souter or others, 
plus on soap. So mm -hmm. with my having had training with Clark, I was able at least at certain points to verify whether or not some of the readings that he had based on von Soden may have been erroneous, which they were in some places. It's von Soden's sure. error, not anybody yes, else. Yeah. Basically, we were fine tuning from 1976 all the way to 1991, but he had already prepared before 1976.